Hi, I'm John Zogby, and welcome to another edition of the Zogby Report, Real and Unscripted. Those of you who have been watching and listening already know the, the score. Uh, I, John, along with my son Jeremy, um, uh, discuss an issue or two of, uh, of recent days, often from different points of view, uh, sometimes not, but it's always civil and respectful, and I hope that we can be a role model for others, notably in Washington. Uh, I didn't open up with, uh, it's another Friday, simply because it's not Friday. This is a special circumstance, so we're actually taping this on Wednesday. It won't be shown or available until Friday, so in case there is breaking news later today or through Thursday and overnight, uh, and we've uh, missed it, there's a very good reason why we can't predict the future. Although, Jer, we do try our best to do that, don't we, sometimes? We do. We do with a little bit of clairvoyance. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Jer is waiting for the topic, and I think this one is unavoidable. Uh, there were hearings uh, that began on Tuesday in Congress, special select committee appointed by the Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, to look into what happened and how it happened and who was responsible for the events of what we now call 1-6, January 6th. Uh, we all know that what took place essentially was that after uh, former Mayor Rudy Giuliani and then immediately former president, uh, well, he wasn't former president, he was still president on January 6th, Donald Trump spoke to a very large rally that um, did not accept the results of the election, uh, that hundreds well over, uh, a thousand, even thousands, marched over to the Capitol and stormed the Capitol and took over the Capitol for a while. Um, it was more than a protest. It was violent. Um, they not only broke through uh, windows and barriers, but some people were severely hurt. Uh, and in fact, a D.C. police officer was killed. A woman protester was killed. It was a frightening moment. Um, here's what I don't understand. Uh, how did this become a political issue? Or why did it become a political issue? Anybody who watched that day uh, saw exactly what happened. Uh, it was the moment that Congress constitutionally is supposed to certify the results of the election and really, there was no doubt whatsoever, including by respectable Republicans, of what had happened. Uh, Joe Biden won the popular vote by more than 6 million votes, and the electoral vote, though close in some states, had been close before. There hasn't been really any evidence or at least sufficient evidence to say that Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or even razor thin Georgia and Alabama were stolen uh, in any way. But let's say they were. Um, let's say that the tables were turned as they were um, in, in 2000, even 2004, when uh, Democrats uh, could have been uh, equally angry, but you didn't see Democrats storming the Capitol uh, when Al Gore lost or when John Kerry uh, conceded. Why is this political? What's going on here? I think it's no surprise. I mean, if, if somebody is to read, um, and remember, historical analogies are, are never perfect. I think Mark Twain put it best. History does not repeat itself. It rhymes, right? <laughs> so, in other words, you, you definitely look to the past to, to an analogous event, but don't expect the exact thing to play out. But mm -hmm. you can see a similar framework, a skeleton, a blueprint. Um, and so I'm talking about, of course, the Civil War. And there's a, you know, I, I, I took a class on dedicated to the Civil War and I read uh, probably the greatest work ever written on, on the Civil War, and that's The Battle Cry of Freedom by James McPherson. 
thousand mm -hmm. page uh, uh, book uh, that covers the, the leading up to it. And of course, this was years ago that I read it, but, but what I heard you discussing reminded me of the lead up, especially the decade uh, before the Big Bang, uh, the decade of the 1850s, especially mm -hmm. the, the, the late 1850s, where there was such mistrust towards uh, both sides, towards both the North and the South, towards um, the, the different cultures, the, 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 the parties that were at odds with each other. And here we are. And, mm -hmm. and you know, if, if you then take, take a look at another historical work, um, the fourth turning was at uh, Strauss and Howe, right? Strauss and Howe, yeah. Uh, every 70 years, America goes uh, through tumultuous events. So 1790 or, uh, or the establishment of, of the constitution uh, was, was a pretty tumultuous time. 70 years later is 1860, um, the civil war. Uh, 70 years later, about 70 years later uh, after that, of course, is the great crash of 29 and basically leading up to World War II and ending with 45, an establishment of, of a new uh, order, you could say, a new regime. And what we see now is the breakdown of that regime. It's 70 years later, it's on time. And you could say that there's a decay, there's a rot, there's a rage, there's a mistrust towards uh, uh, both sides. If you want to blame, uh, pin the blame on Donald Trump, you can do that. I think that's incredibly short-sighted. I think if Trump didn't rise to the occasion, somebody else similar uh, w would have, whoever the candidate would have been in 2016, it, it would have been ugly, maybe not as ugly, but it was on course. And I guess you could say maybe it was kind of baked into the cake. So, um, W w that's the situation that, that we are at, is that there's so much distrust uh, towards the, the, the leadership towards each other. And then, of course, the public uh, doesn't trust the, the leadership. It, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue. Um, all right. So I, I have a number of questions, I, and I think that that's a very smart analysis that, that you just gave. Um, so should we, sh should we be thankful that this kind of tumult doesn't occur more, that in fact uh, we can almost expect it and that we're very fortunate that in between that there are many periods of, of let's say, peace and prosperity and even progress. Should we, we be thankful then that it doesn't occur more? Um. I, I guess that's, I, I suppose that's a way of, 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 of putting it, right? But um, no, I, I just, I think it's unavoidable because I think the leadership is so out of touch with reality. And then of course, you, you also just, I talked about that, you know, that cycle of, of about 70 years. It's the life mm -hmm. of a regime. It's, it's the second law of thermonuclear dynamics um, put into the context of a, a, a political regime, uh, by the third generation, you have power players that are still in power. I mean, here's just one off the top, man. You still have somebody like Henry Kissinger, who, who is a, a, a very influential person. You have people who have been, been powerful bureaucrats for 40, 50 years, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, Joe Biden, Pelosi. It's not just that, uh, uh, obviously, um, uh, uh, others on, on the Republican side as well, they are out of touch with reality. And um, they know how to hold on to power and they know how to keep their positions. But meanwhile, there's all these dynamics happening on the ground and, and they're missing the point. And, and they're, they're further driving a wedge in society and we should only expect that there's going to be more tumult, more tumultuous things like what we saw on, on January 6th. That, that's how I would. Okay, it. and so this, this leads then to the second question, which is after each of those tumultuous periods, um, something new 
and different and huge and even great emerged. Okay, so after the Civil War, we have a period of massive and rapid industrialization, right? And urbanization and global uh, markets, a technological boom, um, greater prosperity for um, the working class, although if you were working class, it may not have felt that way, but it was certainly better than toiling as a peasant um, on, on farms, urbanization and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, after the New Deal, uh, the, or I should say the Great Depression and World War II, you had a tremendous growth in government uh, in the sense that you had the expansion of the welfare state that had actually begun uh, around the turn of the century, but a, a massive expansion of the welfare state. But at the same time, steady growth uh, of the defense uh, budget and um, a period of prosperity based on both an, a, an expansion of, of government, government largesse, and uh, uh, the military. What happens after this one? We are clairvoyant, remember. <laughs> well, I'll take a stab at it, and then and then yeah. you as well. Okay. Um, uh -huh. I I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the pillars of prosperity rested on government largesse. Um, I mean, it, it, that, was, that, was the, that was the effect, right? That, that's what we experienced. But what got government largesse to that level? What got the United States to the, the status of the behemoth um, mm -hmm. on the world stage was the Bretton Woods system, the Bretton Woods agreement that, that you know, you, you, go, uh, you go around the world and you hear the dollar is king. Well, that the, the, the Bretton Woods system propped up the American dollar to be the most powerful currency. Every nation in the world, if they were going to trade, were going to trade in dollars, and dollars were as good as gold. And so that yeah, obviously the Bretton Woods system uh, fell apart, but Kissinger came up with uh, what is known as the petrodollar, and that saved the, 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 the preeminence, the dominance of the dollar. So I think a lot of this is monetarily and economically driven in terms of the, the, the life of those political regimes. So we are at a cusp right now uh, or, or a crossroads after um, the, the COVID-19 crisis. And now there's talk of, of a centrally uh, digitalized, uh, uh, central bank digital currency that other countries are, are talking. China is actually uh, very close to, to setting one up. And so I don't know, it, it, maybe in the Wall Street Journal, you read about it, it's called the Fed coin. Um, mm -hmm. But, but it, would, it would eradicate cash if, if it is to go forward. And it would, it would be a purely digital payment system. Um, on the privacy side of things, there's no more anonymity. Uh, everything that you do is, is tracked. And, and so, I mean, it, you, it, it could go that route. It could go maybe more towards something like a world currency. Of course, the, the, the magazine, The Economist has talked about SDRs, special drawing rights. And um, you know, I, I, those are typically used by the IMF in, in emergencies. But um, most recently, SDRs, which are a basket of, of the major currencies, have included the yuan. And so does that signal something like some kind of basket of currencies that serve as as a world currency that could be a possibility or uh, maybe there's a breakdown of, of all kinds of national currencies because of the the major debt issues across the world economies We're, we are at an amazing moment and it's, it's very difficult to see which way it goes but it seems to be those are about the three options what about you what do you think well, I mean, the obvious answer is I don't know. It can go in both directions. It can go in one direction and then flip and go uh, in, in the opposite direction. But it looks to me, uh, just going back to uh, an earlier point that you had made, that, you know, Bretton Woods and the United Nations and, and that post-war world were based on an American model. Everyone else had fallen apart. Uh, so we were the superpower uh, along with the Soviet Union, but we always had much more stability than the, the, the Soviet Union. And a lot of that 
had to do with democratic institutions. We're probably coming to a point, you know, Fareed Zakaria has talked about the rise of the rest. Uh, George Friedman, the futurist, also talks about a multipolar world where, you know, you have Turkey, you have Poland, in fact, you have Brazil in South America, Nigeria in South Africa, where you don't have one dominant superpower, uh, obviously China and India, but it looks to me as if at some point, and given where millennials and Gen Z are at with um, less uh, loyalty to a nation state or even a permanent home, that we're probably talking about a non-polar world eventually, a, a genuine decline in nationalism, and th then a, a replacement with global lawmaking, global regulations, global institutions of, of enforcement, global institutions of cooperation. Um, as a reminder, uh, in early October, we're gonna have a guest, Parag Khanna, on who underscores that point in a number of his writings. And we'll be uh, talking about his new book called Move, about the movement, the free movement of, of uh, younger people all over the world and those very points that I just made. But I'll be interested to see what the book says. It hasn't come out yet. And, uh, and what he thinks about what we're talking about. But that's not in 2023 or in 2024. Um, this is a slow and steady breakdown of what we have because what we have is clearly not sustainable. But let's go back to the immediate. Um, was this tantamount on January 6th to storming the Bastille, uh, to the Boston Tea Party, to the act of violence, maybe the uh, bloody Kansas in 1854, or the Brooks Sumner incident where Congressman Brooks beat Senator Seward of Massachusetts um, over the head with a cane, knocked him unconscious for uh, a long time. Is this where we're at today? It, it could very well be, although, you know, I, I, I don't like to, I don't, I don't like to, to pin the side on one blame. I, I always enjoy uh, pinning the side on, or pinning the blame on, on, on both sides. And so, I mean, it, it, and I've said this many times, it goes back to 2016. It goes back to the, the denial of the, the presidency of, of Donald Trump. And you and I were saying when, when we started this, the video version of this podcast, we were saying in September and October that whoever wins, the other side is simply not going to accept it. And so if we imagine that, that Trump had won, we would have likely seen almost the exact same situation, maybe not on January 6th, maybe, maybe on another day, may, maybe on Christmas, maybe on, uh, you know, before that, December 17th, who knows, but- um, You know they, what, Jerry? I, I agree with you on that, at least insofar as if you had an identical scenario where Trump won the popular vote and he'd been on top um, uh, in, in the Electoral College and there were close states, um, I, I'm not sure that the, um, that the Democrats would have ac ac accepted it. No, they wouldn't have because they didn't accept it in 2016 and they carried no. that with them for, for four years. And, and so what they would have said was understanding, uh, being objective and walking a day in their moccasins, they would have said two times, this happened to us two times, there would have been rage, there, no question about it. Um, this is just the, the dysfunctional nature of a two-party system, of, of a duopoly that, that, you know, in the imperial city lives the high life, but the rest of the country, or not yeah, you know, the entire rest of the country, but a lot of the country lives in a totally different reality. And so uh, that, that, that's what's at stake. But back to your point, is this the Bastille? Is this the Boston Tea Party? Let's put it this way. It doesn't have to be, but, but antagonizing 
and and continuing the 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 war of of language will ensure that it happens and and i i feel very much like that's likely within the next four years so what what has to happen because because we don't want to just talk about problems we want to talk about solutions is we, we have to hold the leaders and the journalists and the media and the reporters all accountable. The culture needs to switch from labeling to listening. We, what, imagine a world, imagine in America where listening takes priority over labels. There is no shortage of labels and, mm -hmm. and it, they're, they, they're becoming more and more inflammatory. And while that's, is a good short-term strategy and scoring points and putting points on the board and winning the game. It is a terrible long-term strategy. So Congress's job is to investigate and to legislate. And in this context, both the investigation and the legislation are to ensure that this kind of violence not take place again. Um, are you, would you deny the legitimacy of these hearings? Do you think the Republicans should be, should serve on the committee? Do you think the Republicans in good faith should have put five members on the select committee who at least wanted to, uh, to get at the truth of what happened and why it happened? Or do you understand how Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans have, have played this, appointing Jim Jordan and Congressman Ben to, uh, uh, you know, who voted to uh, decertify or, or at least to not certify the results of the election and Pelosi's response to that. Well, I mean, what do you think? Is, is this a legitimate investigation that's taking place, rhetoric notwithstanding? I honestly don't know. I, I honestly can't ans answer that. What to me, what is most worrisome is, is look, we have a surveillance state. There's, there's no, there's no secret about that. Uh, we've had a surveillance state since J. Edgar Hoover, but we've had a gargantuan surveillance state since George W. Bush. And with each presidency, it's, it's grown. And it's, it's, it, Joe Biden has already made it clear that it's going to go to the next level. Um, wh what I'm uh, terribly concerned about is the, is, is the next level of political weaponization in terms of going after the opponents. And, and I don't know how far that or how wide that net will be casted. I don't know if they're just going to keep it to, well, let's just keep it to extremist groups and hopefully... They do that for both left and right extremist groups, or whether they're kind of, you know, uh, casting that net wider. That, that to me, that that's what's really front and center here. So we've got hackers worldwide that have already done serious damage, and we know they have the capacity to do even worse damage in the form of of cyber attacks that shut down businesses, shut down dams, shut down. Uh, uh, grids um, make it impossible for business to be conducted. Um, so we already know of that. We are also know that white supremacist groups, terrorist groups are all over some form of the, the web, are highly networked and highly sophisticated in their capacity to communicate and to plan with each other. Um, doesn't law enforcement have to stay on top of it by staying on top of the technology, mastering the technology and fighting uh, each new weapon with similar weapons? Or is this a cycle that needs to be broken? And do we lose if we do it? Uh, I mean, if you put it that way, then yes, it has to be done, right? <laughs> we have to root out every single... Yeah, that's the kind of answer I was looking for, incidentally. <laughs> no, but go ahead. No, I mean, it's a loaded question. Um, yeah. It, right? So how would you uh, phrase it? it? The challenging question of the day, of the week, if not the month. How, okay, well, well, first off, you acknowledge that it, it's not just extremist groups on the right, that it's, it's extremist groups on the left. You, you don't just say, look, there's 
white supremacy is is the only problem. Antifa is a major problem too. I mean, we had an entire summer of riots where cities went up in flames. I mean, it was it wasn't just like a dozen cities; it was dozens of cities, and that was highly problematic. And and that can happen again too. Um, I, I I think. I think, unfortunately, uh, there, there, there is an element of, of antagonizing from, from the intelligence community. I, I think that there, you saw this with, with the new left, right? I mean, you were oh, a part absolutely. of it. Yeah. I taught right? labor and radical history, um, you know, the Asian provocateur. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, part so, of I mean, so, so that's like part of, part of it is, is is I think is addressing that and, and not just saying, well, you know, that was kind of a thing that the FBI were doing because they thought, you know, in the 60s that the, the, the anti-war people were a bunch of communists. No, they, they undermined an, a, a legitimate movement that had actually had the moral high ground and, and they, you know, we know what they did. Um, and there was COINTELPRO as well, I'm sorry. Um, no, absolutely. It's, uh, no, it's a conversation. And so, I mean, we know that happened then. As I've mentioned before, uh, two of the, the groups that got uh, most of the blame uh, from from January 6th, the Proud Boys and uh, help me out. What, what's the other group? Um, the uh, something keepers. Um, the Oath Keepers. Yes. Thank Oath you. Keepers. Yes. Um, in both cases, the the head people in that one was one was an FBI asset back in 2014, and another one uh, I forget his name, but it, it, the CBS News covered this. Uh, I was thankful for that. He's had security clearance, uh, a high level security clearance since the late 70s. So, so what's going on there? I mean, there maybe there needs to be more investigation into that, right? So, I, I mean, I wonder how much of this. Is is organic and homegrown, and I, I wonder how much of it is is astroturf. We, we we know from history that empires want to grow. They want to expand their power. They never voluntarily cut their power and their resources. And uh, unfortunately, it's one of those questions of who benefits. So I, I mean, is it, it the question that needs to be investigated? Is is it is it exaggerated? Or is it really going to topple this country? So let's end on this note with this question that we'll both answer. Um, is this congressional investigation legitimate? I say yes, but I agree with you that it needs to be expanded. I think it needs legitimate. to be legitimate. Yeah, go ahead. I think it needs to be both bipartisan. So once once they have once they have both parties involved, and it needs to be nonpartisan in its language, but I don't think that's going to happen. That's not going to happen. Okay, we'll end on a happier note um, next week, maybe. Um, but this was great. You're a very smart guy. Um, thank you. Well, you asked challenging questions, so you kind of forced me to, to, to think a lot faster than I normally would. <laughs> I'll see you. Take care. Goodbye, everybody, and please spread the word about the podcast. Take care.